What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Real Spit from a Gangsta Gun Legit. Today, before we get started, I'm going to need you to hit that like and smash that subscribe button. Today, we have a special guest. And for this guest, it's going to be a little different because I need to read the bio. I can't miss nothing for what this man has accomplished. I'm talking about none other than Antonio and Saudi, a.k.a. Troy Style. So let me read to you his bio from when he started. Twice Style, a.k.a. Marco Antonio Ennis, also known as Antonio Saudi, which is the name of his clothing line. Twice Style began as a successful hip-hop artist with the internationally known and notorious rap group, the Almighty RSO, who later changed their name to the Undisputed Made Men. He's been signed to seven major record deals. Tommy Boy, Epic, Virgin, Def Jam, Restless BMG, RCA, and Interscope. He written hooks for and recorded hit songs with platinum artists Faith Ev Evans, Dionne Warwick, Ray J, Master P, Big Pun, Mace, Mob D, Nas, Dog Pound, The East Siders, Scarface, Bone Thugs and Harmony, MOP, Gangsta, 8 Ball and MJG, Queen Pen, Foxy Brown, Total, The Locks, Teddy Riley, Tupac Shakur's group, The Outlaws, among many others. His hit songs, One in the Chamber, and You Can Be My Boo, have made it onto Billboard's Hot Rap Singles chart at number 15 and number 5, respectively. Please welcome my man, the one and only Antonio Saudi. Everything is good, man. Thanks for being a part of the show, man. I really appreciate that. Man, thanks for having me, man. I've been, I've been seeing the, uh, the episodes, and um, you know, told you I was going to come through and get on there. So, finally made it, man. Man, dope, dope. I'm glad you blessed us with your presence. So, look, man, we're going to get right to it, man. Um, so, let's let the people know. You, you you have a bunch of names. So, what name do you go by the most? Um, I mean, it depends on what 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 I'm doing. If I'm doing uh, some of my housing advocacy work, it's going to be Antonio. If it's music, obviously, it's going to be twice that. Mm -hmm. If it's just somebody that knows me from way back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 80s, they're going to call me Marco, okay. uh, which is my first name. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, there was E, there's E Devious, um, right. E's for my last name. Um, yes. Now, E Devious, mm -hmm. wait, wait, did you use that more so when you first started rapping? When I first started rapping, it was Emosis. Oh. And then uh, when I got down with RSO, that came from Benzino. Benzino was the one that kind of put the Devious on it. Oh, okay. Um, because it was E. Most people called me E, short for Emosis, or short for the, the, the first letter of my last name. And so when I got down with them, that's how E. Devious was born. So what, what was the name of the group? What was the first group you started rapping with? Body Rock MCs. That was with Big Chuck, Rib D, MC Knox. Tony Rome was in the group one time. BDB was the beatboxer mm -hmm. at that time. Um, so yeah, the Body Rock, Body Rock MCs was the first group. And I was I was like the main writer of that group. I used to write all of our routines, and I would highlight them with, you know, yellow highlighter, pink highlighter, blue highlighter. I would write it, and I would highlight everybody's part. Like your part would be blue. So anytime you see blue, that's when you come in. Anytime you see yellow, that's where the next place. So it was. Oh, so you was an organizer at a young age. Yeah, yeah. I always I I need organization. That was always. Okay. Okay. So um, tell us, where, where did you come from? Where did you grow up? Right in, grew up right in Dorchester, right around in Dorchester, the streets of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, man, uh, you, Mattapan, uh, originally the South End, when, when we first came in from Honduras, it was the South End, my grandmother um, had, uh, was renting a house down there, and then she bought the house in Dorchester, we moved up to Dorchester and grew up there. Okay, so what, what year are we talking about when, when you started, when you knew that you had the talent for this rap thing and you took it seriously? When, you, when would you say you took it serious? I, I took it probably serious in 79 when I had an opportunity to, to write a, a, a song or a song or it was like a, a contest with W-I-O-D. They were having a contest. You had to write something about the station. And 
and I did that and I won. It was like a small prize or something. I can't remember what it was, but um, that was um I, after I seen the movie Wild Style. That's what made me wanna officially be a rapper, an MC. That's what made me wanna hold the mic and control the crowd and and mm -hmm. and, and write and, and that whole b boy aspect. You, know? you just said something that I'm sure a lot of uh, young rappers today don't even know about. You said MC. And that and the MC is totally different than a than a rapper, isn't it? I would say so. Yeah, MC yeah. was the one that controlled the crowd and and had everybody. If they told him say ho, they said ho, right? Yeah, and the MC kind of just has a little bit more of a grasp on what hip hop is. A rapper is just kind of like going with the flow and doing what everybody's doing. The MC, you know, MC can pick up the mic and, and rock a crowd at any time. Got you, got you. Okay, so. You said seventy nine. You started rapping. Now, when when did you meet? When did you leave that group and get with RSO? That was like eighty. Hmm. Ah, man, I want to say eighty four, maybe eighty four, eighty five, somewhere along those lines. And who are the members of RSO? So at that time, RSO was um, Benzino. Um, um, Jeff Two Times was DJ, uh, Kev Ski, uh, Orange Man, mm. and, uh, Tony Rome had went from uh, from um, Body Rock over into uh, RSO. Okay. Um, and so I got down. Did I leave somebody out? If I did, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> right, no, right, no, right. No, right. Honestly, we're, we're going all the way back, so I yeah. get it. But um, if if Orange Man didn't get locked up at that time for that unfortunate uh, murder that he didn't have nothing to do with. I would have never got down with RSO. I got oh. down because of his void. Gotcha. And, and, and um, Benzino needed, he wanted someone to fill his void. And he, he approached me on, you know, on get down with us. If you got down with us, man, we'll be this, we'll be that. Like, you you know, he knew I was bringing value to what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he always had a vision for what he wanted to do with, with his group, which, mm -hmm. which RSO is his, was his group, okay. is his group. Um, he was pretty much the front man for that. Gotcha. Um, and so I just, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I never wanted to be the front man. I was the front man with, with the crew that I came from with Body Rock, with, with Big Chuck. Pretty much I was the front man, but I didn't want to go over to RSO and be the front man. I just wanted to, like LeBron, bring my talents to RSO and, and create history, which we did. Right, right, right. Absolutely. You definitely did. Um, speaking of which, um, one thing that sticks out in my mind when we talk about RSO, and I'm sure... Anybody from that era would, would say the same things is the reputation that you guys started getting yeah. while you were doing your shows. I mean, the more shows you were doing and the more um, fans that you started accumulating, mm -hmm. you also started getting a lot of people that didn't like you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, tell, tell them why that is. Um, I think, you know, because we were, we were essentially from the street. We were street dudes doing street shit that young street dudes do. But at the same time, we had talent, All right. and we wanted to maximize that talent. We loved the hip hop culture, so we had one foot in the in the streets, and we had the other foot in the industry, trying to do our thing, trying to right. be successful. That's a hard thing to balance when you're young, right. when you got money, when you're getting more money in the streets than you are in the in the rap in the rap game. You know, right. we, was, we was getting major. I was getting a lot of money in the streets that. I didn't. I wasn't really caring about the industry too much. Like I would make money, and, and and you know I would give it to Ray. He would book studio time. Like he was, he was like that. He was doing this hustling too. But we all were hustling. Um, and, and so when you say you know, hustling, what, what do you mean? Were you selling I, drugs? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were selling drugs. We was running around holding guns. We was getting into fights. We was, you know, we was running the streets, doing doing wild things. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, it comes enemies. Right. And um, and and then with us being who we are and being, um, you know, being in the limelight, being known, you know, girls would like us, right. and we would we pretty much would mess with all kinds of women, and that would bring jealousy from dudes who may have liked that girl or that may have been their girl or something like that. So all of those type of things breed breed jealousy. So we yeah we we had to navigate through that while still trying to. Um, be be who we are and do what we do. So this, the the reputation came from all of the activity that we caused and was into in the streets. Right. Okay. So, um, 
what made you guys change your name from RSO to Made Men? Yeah, so that was... And give us like a timeline. That was around, oh man, wow. I would have to say like 94, we changed the name. 94, 95 or something. We changed the name from RSO to Made Men specifically because we were part of the Source magazine. Um, everybody knows that Benzino owned half of the magazine with Dave. Mm -hmm. um, he did a lot for Dave to be successful with that magazine. A lot of people give Benzino a bad rap in terms of... And, and one thing about me, man, facts, I don't distort facts. And I, I don't care like, like if me and you didn't get along. I, I could Things that are facts, I wouldn't discount that because we don't get along or because whatever it is. Facts are facts, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and and people a lot of people need to understand that he did contribute a lot to the success of the source. Now, people have their own views about it on why it went down and so forth and so on. That's fine. But you'll never take away the fact that he did help Dave to bring, bring, that, that, up. To bring that up. Absolutely. And I respect Absolutely. you for saying that because you're right. That's what people should deal with regardless. Facts. Facts yeah. are facts. Yeah. No matter what it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't play I like those that. other games, man. Right. Okay, so... Made, but that, but on. So I don't want to cut you off. But right. I, I never answered the question. It, we they changed it because they didn't like us. We changed the name because the writers up there didn't like us getting a write up in the magazine. They thought because we were tight with Dave that we were getting special treatment. But we actually had good music, and um and so they wrote a big thing to all of the record companies. Sent it out a mass email to all of the major labels saying, "Yo, these dudes are trouble. They're gang man." bangers, they're murderers, they're this, they're that. So the whole industry didn't want to mess with us no more. We were blackballed. We couldn't get no shows. We couldn't get no studio time. We couldn't. It was bad. Mm. So we decided, let's change our name. Let's change our look a little bit and come at the industry a little bit different. And we changed it to Made Men. We kind of came with a little bit more of a grown-up look. We, we kind of left the bees, the Boston Bruins logo bees mm -hmm. that, that was prominent with the RSO look. Mm -hmm. We kind of put that to the back and that's when we brought Antonio Saldi as our look and then we started to push that oh, as okay. our as our look instead of the B. So that's when you started getting into learning how to design clothes and, and putting that on? No, nah, I was doing I was designing clothes and being creative with clothes before I got in the group. I've always oh. been a fashionable dude. Like my thing when I was thirteen or fourteen was going to uh you know, AJ Wright and, and, and Marshalls and TJ Maxx buying the Tommy Hill figures and all of the Izards and all of that stuff. And just, I just always was fashionable. I was matching my clothes, my belts, my socks. like, And so I took that whole persona into made men and cultivated the Bruins look. Now, I didn't, I didn't specifically come up with that, but I helped advance it right. and, and make it, you know, broad and that's what we were known for right you guys were known for those leather jerseys that's something that yeah. you designed yeah yeah all of those things was from my my pen you know mm -hmm. um and putting it to the paper and then going to high voltage was downtown tom used to own it he had the, he had the connection with rosanna who's my partner but she, you know at that time she didn't know us he was the middleman so for years we was going to him with my designs that i drew and saying this is what we want done and he would go to her and say, this is what they want done. And then she would make it and he would come back. He would sell it to us, but put his price on top of it. So that went on for a long time until I got tired of him making all of that money. And I demanded to meet her. He didn't want to let me meet her. He was like, she'll never want to meet you. She's classical. You're too, you're too street, blah, blah, blah. One day he wasn't there. I went and, and, and asked one of the dudes that he worked for. I kind of hemmed him up and told him to give me the number. <laughs> and he gave me the number, and I ended up meeting Rosanna, and it was totally opposite of what he was saying. She she wanted to meet me because she was like, you're the dude that I've been making all these stuff, these bros. She's like, wow. And so, so by you playing into the made men persona, and you went there and said, look, we gonna, we gonna, you're going to show me who this is, or, or, or something, something will happen. Yeah, that was, it, that's it the down. shit that we used to do. That <laughs> right. was the street shit. That was the one foot in, one foot, one foot out. out. I got it, I got it. So... Okay, so you you got the, the the brand started now. You're wearing it now. You you have the source, and you guys are getting. I mean, every time you open a source, you see another one of you. You started the bulletproof vest. Mm -hmm. You have that going on. Um, and I, I think you had a lot of celebrities at the time. When I, if I can remember, I know I seen Tretch in it. Um, mm -hmm. um, tell me who else you had in there. Oh uh, man, Tretch, uh, Ludacris, Wardos, Trick Daddy, um, Fifty Cent. Um, ja Rule. Oh, so that Snoop vest Duff. that Fifty was wearing was one of yours? Yeah, the one. Oh. Yeah, the one that had his name on it. Yeah. In the wheelchair, many men. 
Man, yeah. man, that, in That's that you. video, yeah, yeah. That's you. Like, if it wasn't for rain, Joe wouldn't feel so good. He had, if he had asked for that at the time. And so we just put his name on because he was making that video. 50 was coming up at that point. Right. But yeah, I mean, that, that vest, that came from the mind of Tang the Juice, who's my cousin as well. Oh, okay. And he... When I when I started the brand, sitting in my room, he was like, "So what are you gonna do? What are you gonna make that people's gonna want to buy your stuff?" And he had he had a real one on that day. He was going through some shit, and he had one on. Just happened to have it on while we were con conversing, and um, and he was like, "Yo, what, what about making one of these?" And, and then, you know, tapping. I'm like, "You can't make those with the plates and all that. We right. can't do that." And he's like, "Nah, don't don't do it with the plates. Just make it fashionable, like so right. everybody could rock it." And it was like it was one of those. Type of moments, and I was right. like, "Let me see it. Let me hold it." And he was like, "He took it off. He's like, hey, hold it. Do what you gotta do." So I dissected it, and you know, how am I going? How am I gonna do this? And the first one I did, it was leather, and I did put some plates in it. But that was the very first item that we made as an, a, a brand mm -hmm. to introduce ourselves. That was dope. And look where it is now. What is this like? Thirty some years it's, later. Yeah, man, and, and it's that, still going. It's been knocked off from Kanye West to the Vucci to. Uh, Maurice Malone to a bunch of new up and coming brands that are coming up now. That I just seen know, a vest the other day that someone yeah. was putting out as theirs. Yeah, yeah, it's like you know that you can't really patent a design per se. You know what I'm saying? You can't really you can't patent it like that. Um, so that's why people can make it as long as they switch it up a little bit. If you right. do, if, if you just switch it up a little bit, you're good. It's yours, right? Right? Yeah. Right? Okay. So. What do you like more? Do you like the, the fashion side or do you like emceeing um, the rap side? Well, now I like the fashion side more because I, I had my, you know, I still do music. I still love music. We got some great music coming out right now. But I, for me, the fashion uh, thing just has a little bit more longevity to it. It's, it's, I just like it better because it's, it's, it's a creative space. Music is too, but fashion is a very creative place for me to be. And I love being creative. Okay. Which one have you had more success with? Ah, man, that's a good question. Um, I would have to... Wow. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, mm. Ah, man. But well, the good thing is that, that, that you had success with both yeah, of them. I mean, yeah, that's a great... That, you know, that is a good yeah, question. But I, good. I don't know. I would have to say probably the music. But then that's... Because the clothes is international too, man. Right. So... I don't know. They, it may be a, the music a little bit more, maybe a tad bit more, but, but they, not much. Yeah, not much. And they've both been good. They've both kind of been working hand in hand. I think one had, you know, one washes the other. One helped the other. Uh, me being in the group helped my brand be able to sprout because I was able to get close to other artists, right. and in the source also helped me because I was able to have free ads that Fubu had to pay sixty thousand dollars for. Right. Oh, Maurice Malone, eighty thousand dollars for the ones they and I was right next to them. And you get it for free. And I get it for free. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. So okay, so Antonio Saudi, the man with many names, you have hat different so many different hats. You uh um, a designer, you know, you have your own clothing line. Mm -hmm. You you're also an actor now. Yeah. That is. I've seen a couple of your little, <laughs> your little movies you've been doing, and I mm -hmm. think you're gonna hit big with that too, man, because you mm -hmm. know, you seem like you got natural talent with that. Um, okay. So, have you completed a movie yet, or we? Um, I wrote a I wrote a script called The Bank Attack, and we did a light uh, screening for it. We're actually in the process. We're trying to sell it right now. To be totally honest with you, mm -hmm. um, and th this just came about maybe two weeks ago. Um, so, that's the script. We we de we never finished the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't did an actual full length filmed movie. What I've been doing lately is vignettes, which is acting scenes within a music video that you tell a story with and, and you tie it together. So most of my videos and songs that are coming out now are laced that way because it's allowing me to bring other actors in, keep writing scripts, something that I love to do, and keep developing it. Developing it. So it's just getting better and better as we go. Um, as I build that and as I come into some more resources, I'm going to start to get in, into uh, completing full, full films. Okay. Well, I seen something by you. Um, so explain that. You said, "What is it? What is it called? Was that a short film?" Um, vignette. When you okay, vignette. Yeah. That was for the music video. Mm -hmm. But I seen something that wasn't a music video. You were you were some a drug dealer and playing a role 
Um, what was your name in this, man? Just don't, don't need them. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> that, that was, <laughs> you might have been looking at Trap Life or One, yeah. Once Upon a Gun, maybe. Uh, Those are vignettes. Oh, that's a Those, vignettes. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a music video that, let's say, let's say you got a song. Mm -hmm. the songs, most songs may start off with a four-bar uh, intro. Then you got 16-bar verse or 18 or 12-bar, whatever you want. And then you got the hook. Then you got another verse. And then you got the hook. So what I'll do is the first hook in the first verse will be a music video and before the, the the i mean yeah before the hook comes in it'll be acting scenes and then it'll go back to the music video then it'll stop then it'll go to acting scenes so that's what you was watching mm, it was a was good. music video with acting scenes r kelly used to do it a lot with right the i remember video. that with the closet thing mm -hmm. okay okay so it's called those are, yeah vignette and those are those are fun to do man right it's, it's, yeah, because it seemed like you was really believing that road too. You was making it. What do you, how do you say it? Don, how do you call Donito it? Montana. Donito. <laughs> Donito, <laughs> Donito, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah Donito. That was cool. So um, so you have more of that coming? Absolutely. Yep, okay. We're getting ready. We, the next one is called Kill Shot. And, um, and we're going to start filming that in March. Okay, Kill Shot. So you said, I mean, that you had one foot in the street and one foot in the industry. Yeah. Um, what made you take, what made you get both feet up and go ten toes down into the industry? Because, and when did that happen? Um, that happened, I would say, right around when, a little bit after Latifah signed us, because it kind of got serious when Latifah picked us up and put us on Flavor Unit. Um, and so we, because she was the way she was, we had to kind of get serious about shit, because she was flying us places, she was booking stuff for us to do. And we needed to be there. And we had to chill out some of the shit we was doing. So I think right around after RCA is when started to try to take. I don't think we ever totally took our feet all the way out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you start lifting it out and start to try to realize you got to balance. Life is a balance. And, that, and that's really what it was about, trying to balance the shit to, to be able to get further. Because when you don't, then all your hopes and dreams go down the drain. I see a lot of that happen these days with, with artists. They, they're really talented, but they don't. it doesn't come to fruit because dudes refuse to take that foot out the, the game. Do you think the, um, the rap scene in, in Boston um, is dead, or you think that it's, it's, it's alive still? It's definitely not dead. It's, it's, it's definitely not dead. Boston has a lot of talent. Uh, to, to me, Boston's problem is um, artists, when I say that, are uh, competing blindly. Competing, when I say that, I mean like competing in a way that people don't want to realize if somebody has a better opportunity, pull back on your shit and invest in that person who has a better opportunity. And from that, other people can get on. Like everyone else does it. Like Wu-Tang did it. Um, you, you, it goes on. Like people, people put their pride to the side and... Everybody in Wu Tang didn't blow up at the same right. time, but they all had successful careers because right. they was cool with Meth going first. Right. Meth was that dude. Right. Nobody, Raekwon and them wasn't jealous. They knew their time was coming. You know what right. I mean? Like Tony Stark and them, they didn't care. They knew they they all had successful careers, and, and Boston could be the same way. But I just think Boston's worrying about Nah, I ain't helping him because he's gonna blow up before me. Boston's smaller, so you know everybody. Mm. But no, I, I agree with that, man, 100%. I was thinking um, recently that if, and it goes kind of what you were just saying, if we could get behind that one hot artist, everyone just pull for him to make it, and then, like you said, have that mentality that once he's up, then it's the next one up, I think that this city could do it because there's a lot of talent there's out there. a lot of talent. A lot of talent. And on that, since I'm on that note, I want to bring to everyone's attention that, of course, you guys see that I have a, uh, the gangsta gun legit on and it's brand here. Um, I can't front no form of fashion like I have to salute the man who has done this, who's the pioneer, which is Antonio Saudi. Um, bro, and I think I told you to see when I used to come buy stuff from you that I love what you was doing. Um, yeah, yeah. the inspiration has always been there, and I'm nowhere near the success you've had, but I'm getting a nice taste of it right now. Mm -hmm. and. I want to I want to commend you, you know, in front of the world. I want to let everybody know because this is what we don't do. And I like this in Nori's um, show. They they talk about giving people their their roses while they're alive. You can smell them. So that's what I want to do right now is make sure I acknowledge that 
Antonio Saudi is definitely the pioneer. He's been doing it before. A lot of the designers you see out there now, including us, um, and he has international success with it. And if so, what I want to say to you is one, I thank you for being that dude that took it upon himself to say, look, I know what I want. I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to go get it. And you stayed with it no matter through the ups and downs. You never gave up. Right. What that showed me was as, as a person who's new to the game and looking at it like, look, we might not hit the first year. We might not hit the second year. We might not hit the third year. But if we stay true to it, we're going to get that. Get there. And get right there. now we're in our third year, brother, and I'm proud to say that. Doors open. You can start seeing the thing, the fruits of your labor. It's like yeah. the Source magazine. That started here in Boston as one a one page newsletter. It was right. just a one page newsletter that Dave would. He's a, uh, a, a DJ on the radio, and he would he would say, "Oh, tonight the parties is happening at dorm such and such on, at Harvard University." And next week, blah, blah, blah. but it was just a newsletter with information, mm. and he didn't see any residuals or fruits from his labor until 10 years later. But when that wow. 10 years kicked in, millions started to come. Right. Exactly. And then that's how we started to become so popular. And, you know, it. so what I'm saying is you got to have a, a plan, you, a three to five year plan, a five to 10 year plan. But within that plan, you got to be committed to it. You right. can't have a three, five year plan and then you only invest two years into it. Got you, got you, got you. So um, let me ask you this. How do you feel about the other designers that have come after you in Boston, not anywhere else, but just in Boston, particularly, do you, do you hate on any of them or do you, do you, you know, embrace them as well? I, man, I, I embrace anybody who I see coming out of this town, especially the ones that ask me for advice and ask me questions on how to build their brand and things like that. There's some, there are some brands in Boston that, um, uh, that don't acknowledge me as as who I am and what I've contributed to the game of fashion. I mean, FUBU wasn't even before. The only brand that was before us was Cross Colors and Carl Kanai. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, it's not the point that I don't need any pats on the back, but I'm a big believer in, in loyalty and history and, and homage. And um, so to hate on anybody would, for me, especially if they're b behind me or anything like that, and I really don't even look at like to look at any as anybody behind me because I don't even want to put myself up here. Mm -hmm. I'm just me, man. If people want to put me up here, then that's on them to put me there. But I wish I wish everybody success. I've been in clubs with my boys, and we'll be in clubs, and and I'm and and people are like with me. People are always stopping me, always asking me this and blah blah blah. blah. Just when we were coming here, me and my girls in the car, and and and, and I'm in the dudes chasing me down. Getting ready to wreck his car just to say what up. <laughs> and I'm not interested in things like that, man. That's right. just a bit much because I'm a man who I'm not going that far to say what's up to any man. That's it. I'm not. But anyway, it's it's just a it's a it brings a whole uh it makes me very uncomfortable. I don't like when people roll up on me like that. It, it's just I just don't I don't, I don't like it. Um but to 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 put it in perspective, uh, I'm saying, like, I would be in clubs and my boys would be like, you know, fuck telling that nigga the game. Fuck sharing knowledge with this nigga. Nigga, there's bitches in there. Nigga, you need to give it these bitches. And, and I, I would never, no one that was ever talking to me can ever say that I got them was like, yo, peace, man. I stay there and talk to them and drop jewels on them and, and tell my boys, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I know this bitches in here. Like, y'all, you know, do what you do. You know, I got more enjoyment out of trying to uplift the brother. But exactly. dudes won't tell dudes that. You right. know what I'm saying? Dudes mm -hmm. won't come out and tell you that Antonio spent his whole night in the club teaching me the game when he could have been getting phone numbers to get and take a chick home. Right, right. They right. won't tell you that. Nah, because I've never heard that story, man. Yeah, but but I, and won't, I won't say you won't. I have heard the others. And yeah, you hear the suckers. Right, that, right, and that's right. what, and see, and then niggas would be like, do you hate on anyone? Nah, I just tell real shit. That's right. all. They, and if it's hating, if you think it's hating because I said some real shit, I don't know what I don't know what to tell you after that. <laughs> you right, right. No, I get it. I get it. Not like that. So, um, all right. So, I want to go back a little bit before we, um, go forward and, and talk about what we're doing today. Um, so, did you ever, um, uh, get arrested for any of your street? Um, yeah, yeah. Plenty of times. Plenty, plenty of times. times. Plenty of times. Okay, did you have a good time? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. In Boston, plenty of time. In Connecticut, uh, New York. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, and that was a product of just being on tours, being going to uh, pick up drugs, going to make transactions. Um, you know, hopping on the Trump shuttle back and forth to New York. We did that on a regular hopping on that forty-five dollar Trump shuttle back then, bringing mm -hmm. mad dope back. Like it was, right. you could put, you could bring dope on the plane back then. Right, it was like right? right. Yeah, we, so we did that. We was going to New York like five, six times a day. Mm. It was only 45 minutes in the air. Right. So, yeah, that was, you know, some of the times it didn't turn out. You know, it turned out you know, sometimes the boys would be on you before you even make it back to the airport. Right, right. So, yeah. Okay. So, when, when did that, when did that, um, when did you come to the terms to say, you know what, man, I fuck this street shit. I'm, I'm going to focus on this and I can get the same money in it through, through my talent. Was that when you got with the source and, and Latifah on Tommy Boy? Yeah, I mean, you know, same yeah, because yeah, we started getting record deals. Once we started getting record deals on the merit of our music, man, it, 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 it felt good. Because right. one thing we were, we knew how to make good music. That's one thing nobody could take. I don't from, I don't think know. anybody could. Um, I don't think there's someone out there. I'm gonna agree with you on that. I don't think there's someone out there that could say the production and lyrics. It was yeah, dope. It yeah, was. It was. Yeah. It was. You complete. could say what you want about our think, attitude right. and, and all of that, and I didn't like them because I don't know he fucked my girl or he beat my uncle up or whatever. But you could. You can't take nothing about our music right. away from our music. And what was it that everybody didn't like? Because that I, that's pretty much what you heard. Like man, fuck the Marso dudes, man. Like. I just think we was hard to beat, you know what I'm saying? In a lot of different areas, we was hard to beat. And when you're hard to beat, it frustrates people. That's a good way of looking at that. Okay. So, speaking of um, Made Men, RSO. So, now, we're, now, now we're, we're done with the RSO period. Let's go into Made Men. Mm -hmm. So, Made Men was you, Benzino, mm -hmm. and Cool Jesus. Cool Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now... Did you feel any animosity when Cool Jesus got in the group? Hell no. No. Fuck, fuck no. Okay. G is my brother. Dope. I loved when G was got down with us. Like, G's been my man since TDS Mob. G's my man to this day. Like, that's that's G's really my brother. Like, I love G, man. A lot of times dudes out here be scared to say like they love another man, they love another right. dude, and then be like, yo, no homo, what up? I you never say no that. homo because right. if you thinking homo, then you know what I mean. Like right. I'm never, ne if I say I love you, P, like you should, I should never, I shouldn't have to say no, no homo. homo. Right, right. Why do I know the man you are? Yeah, like why, why can't I love you? Right, you know what right. I'm saying? I'm not in love with you. You know what I mean? Like niggas <laughs> right. be getting fucked up, and, nah, that's, and that's what causes the the rift of 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 the, of, of us having unity. Because dudes are scared. They they have these feelings, and if you a street nigga, you gotta be ah man, like. Do you regret leaving Made Men? There's yes and no, yes and no. When I left, when I left the group at that time back in two thousand, um, it was right after I got out the hospital when I got stabbed. And the major part of me leaving the group was the what me being stabbed caused trauma on my oldest daughter. Okay, we were gonna t we were gonna get into that a little later, but you know what? Since you brought it up, why don't we just? I think this is a good time to talk about that now. Then, mm -hmm. so why don't we talk about the stabbing? So, are we talking about the incident that happened at the, the fleet fleet center? Yeah, which I think back then it was called the Boston Garden, right? Nah, it's Boston Garden. It's the it's the TD TD Garden, Garden now. now. It was the fleet. Center oh, so now. the fleet center. Okay, mm -hmm. so so what happened? Oh, they was, was looking for X. They was DMX. looking for X. Somebody who looked like X did something to one of his sisters. sisters. Queen pin or something. In like, Boston. I thought it was Queen. Or so somebody. They did somebody who looked like X did something. Nigga said. So they was super deep. We fucking up. If we can't find X, we fucking this whole tour up. Automatically, this nigga was what? Goes in the hallway and then it jumps off. <coughs> it was a standoff. Yeah, that shit was crazy. <laughs> so I went in the me and Ray was cool. So I went in the hallway, it was like and this is an arena hallway. That shit was packed. They was, we all went in the hall. They was, our room, our dressing room went out there to the yeah, hallway. We got out there. Room. It was a million made men with 
Avery Rexes that said I'm big and all something. Yo, them niggas had um batons. You know the ones that you pat down to see if you got um, guns on you. They was hitting us with those and shit. You know them big yeah. metal black shits? and yellow joints. black and yellow joints. And, you know. I'm Cavo. I'm you actually it chopping it up with Benzino. Me and me and Ray's chopping up. Ray's trying to defuse it. That's yeah. my. He yeah. Ray's a good dude. We mm -hmm. fuck with Ray's cool. Yeah. So we chopping it up. Ray's thick man, right over his shoulder. Always. His ice grill and everything is like he don't Wait, care. He still didn't move. He ain't move. He ain't care what Ray was saying. He ain't move. He's just like this. And I'm asking him, yo, ketchup. A small ketchup came from ketchup nation. came from the a other room side. Room service ketchup. Look, <laughs> some fuel. The sprite came from outside. <laughs> then it was like cartoon. Like then they clicked <laughs> Rockstar. <laughs> they yeah. clicked Rockstar yeah. first. They clicked out. They clicked out. They clicked the smartest dude they on tour. Like they, they clicked like a <laughs> They clicked like a Siglier. They clicked like nerd sick. genius. Then they boom. I'm hearing mad shit in the Then we like this. I ain't boom. going out there. I told niggas I ain't going out there. I'm drinking. Me and Busy drinking and shit. I open the door. This nigga Styles bleeding. Said I love it. I'm looking at his face. Said I love it. The blood coming down his face. Just said oh he shit. Had the that shit looked like West Side Story. He had the mustache with the blood yeah. with the two knives. But yo, at the time they wouldn't pass that line. And then somehow we went past their line and shit. But yeah. that, it was and crazy. That like, yeah, because they, they started overpowering us on the blows. They had Smalls wild on. manpower. They had, they had man man so off, We had knives, though. We, we had hawks. That's how we, we, uh, the uh, hawks came out. Then it was like... And then it was like a separation. Mm. For a minute. And then I fell. My sneaker was off. I was like half knocked out. I was hyped, though. Like, I was, right. I was super hyped. And then... We just went, we went crazy. I got crazy. in the mix of that bitch, Then Luch, woo, right. we put some so work came, in that day. He kind of came in like a wrestler coming he down the aisle to the middle of the fight. He came in right? like, yeah, boom, Fact. boom, boom. One hit of quitters. The niggas put us in the same bullpen. Yeah, wow. then we was in the bullpen. In Boston. And then I kept hearing my name. And then I was, I was like usual suspects, though. I said, I was bleeding. I hit the floor. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> Left it at that. But then I was crazy because they said, y'all should have killed Ray. Yeah, that's what the police, police told us. We should have killed, killed Ray. Ray Benzino. Nobody killed Ray. Nobody killed Ray. Y'all should have killed Ray. Bring us him. They was on that. That was fucking he crazy. He was so bus. strong. He was strong. Him they had to well. pull the tour buses up to the precinct and get us out of there because he had the hotel surrounded. We had the. That was the last um, show of the tour. We was on the what tour. What tour we talking about? Cash Money and um and Rough Riders. Okay. And we were opening up, and we were op we would only act that didn't have stage props, meaning we didn't have, you know, cars roll, you know, cars coming up. I mean, when I turn this up, you know, we didn't have any cars and things like that, you know, all of the big, we just was rocking. Mm -hmm. And so, because we were just rocking, and then you say again, why people don't like you, like, we was rocking without props. That makes dudes not like you, because it's like, damn, they got, they got to need nothing. We didn't need nothing, we nah. just needed our, us. Um, so it was the last day of the tour, here in Boston, so of course we 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 geeked up. We are we finishing the tour in our hometown. Mm -hmm. It's like Tom Brady playing the Super Bowl in his hometown right, now. You right. know what I'm saying? We like we closing the tour in Boston. Hell yeah, we gonna rip this motherfucker. All our people coming out, twenty one thousand. You know what I'm saying? So we was feeling ourselves. Um, it was, it was really good. Um, and so me, Benzino, and and Queen Penn was sitting watching the show, and. She got up and went somewhere and came back. And when she came back, she sat right between me and Benzino, like me and you were sitting. Scooted right down in there and was like, DMX wanna holler at you. Talking to Ray, Benzino. And, um, you know, about what? And he was, I don't know, some girl. So he's like, okay. So we go back there, not really thinking nothing's nothing because we really didn't know what it was. but. You sent for us, okay, so we coming. So we get back there. Um, he doesn't come out. He doesn't come out the room at, when we get there. And the locks come out. We was really cool with the locks at that time. We just did a song with them. I, I did a bunch of their... Uh, what song was that? Um, Tommy's thing. It was right. on the Belly soundtrack. That went gold. It went gold, and we gave them the plaque. Nice. We could have kept the plaque because it was our song. Right. But... Again, we was in the streets. We didn't give a fuck about a plaque. Like, now... Right, now you know you wish you had it. Yeah, but we didn't. Give, we gave that to them niggas, man. Right. And so, um, you know, they came out. And it, they didn't come out like, yo, uh, uh. We was trying to find out what's going on. Styles P even was like, yo, what's going on? Because we was really tight, man. Real cool dudes. And somebody on our side threw something over the top from the back. Mm. While, while me, Benzino, and, and um, Jada... 
um, Styles, uh, Sheik, you know, and the rest of the couple of dudes they had with them. And when that happened, someone on this side picked it up and threw it back. And then it just it just turned into a melee. Now, in the back, if you've ever been to the fleet center, if you stand in that back hallway, if you stand in the middle of the hallway and go like this, you you could pretty much touch both walls. Okay, so it's, so it's tight, yeah. Okay. And now you're talking about 60, 70 dudes back there. Um, you know, dudes got uh, the, all kinds of weaponry in their hands, you know, mops, brooms, the spray things, the wands that you check people at the door. But, like, people had all kinds of shit. And then somebody came through and threw them some knives in the middle of the fight. And then, you know, it, it, it got crazy. And I got stabbed that well, night. someone else had knives and gave it to them. Someone, so yeah, some, yeah, nah. Someone, someone, one of their crew members went and got a bag of knives and came back and gave them some knives. <laughs> wow. So then they, they start, once they started stabbing, you know, trying to stab people, I ended up getting stabbed in my back. We, we was beating these niggas with our hands against those knives. We was beating these niggas back. They'll tell you that in their fucking interviews. I've heard a couple of them you know say I mean? that. Yeah. And so, and then, and, 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 and even then, when that had happened, a lot of people was like, oh, uh, Rough Riders fucked up RSO finally. People was happy for thinking that that happened. That's a fact. Niggas didn't fuck us up, man. Bottom hold line, on, I'm sick up. of these interviews say with niggas. Again. I'm sick of these interviews with niggas with the, oh, and Locks fucked y'all up. And I like, ask the Locks who fucked who up. Like, it, it, it comes down to that, man. And, and for me... The fact that DMX didn't come out the room when he sent for us, as a nigga from the street, I don't respect that. Nah, how could you? you I don't respect that. You can't send for no... You can't send for a man or men, and they show up, and your men's is out on the front line, and you hear that, and you know that, and you fucking still don't come out. And then niggas like, oh, why are you dissing the locks on it? I never dissed the locks on that song. Like, I I, I responded to the truth. Styles P didn't stab nobody. Styles P was like one of the first niggas to catch it. So, but, you know, niggas want to get on their records and talk shit. I was going to be, I was the only one that was going to respond to that. Nobody in Boston was gonna, wasn't going to was going to respond to that. You know why? Because niggas in Boston would rather leave the porch light on for the locks to think that the locks is going to put them on. Niggas would rather be groupies than to say, fuck that, man. Like, I, but it's just funny. There's a lot of funny shit that goes on here and the mentality of niggas here and, and what niggas will do and how much cock niggas will put in their mouth to thinking that they're going to get on. So it was a lot of people in this town that was upset with me when I when I said what the fuck I said. But my thing was like, this song was called what, what, what You Need to Know, What Else You Need to Know, or something like that. And my shit was like, what else they didn't know? Mm. We're the underdogs of this industry. We're the dudes in this industry that dudes always felt like our music wasn't good enough. We just beat people up. Mm. But it was the opposite. Our music was very well good enough. And so we get the bad end of the stick because people just think we was bullies. We mm. wasn't bullies. We just wasn't but the I bitches. Mean, right. But you guys came... With the name made men, with this gangster persona, with fifty to hundred men behind you wherever you go, you're beating up other artists. See, you always are just beating but, up niggas in the street. You was fucking up artists, and let's be real. But we wasn't <laughs> fucking. We we never fucked nobody up just for the sport of it. Anybody that got fucked up had it coming. There was a reason for it. Well, let's talk about. I'm on something. Now. I remember something in Miami. What happened to? I I think I was there. I was there, but I don't remember the detail. But I remember an incident with Fat Joe. Yeah, that he was just busting the head. Yeah, <laughs> again, that was it. Was our turn to rock? That's what I thought. He didn't get off the stage. He didn't right? get off the stage, and he he was treating us like fuck them niggas. You know right. what I mean? Because we wasn't on his level in terms of what he thought. Right. And so, uh, shit happened, and 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 he had to realize, nah, nigga, get the fuck off the stage. It's time for us to rock. Right. And so, if that's being a bully, I don't know. We just, we just, you know, that was just us. Fuck it. Do you regret some of y'all's actions? I mean, there's some things that obviously when you move forward in life and you look back at things, there's things that you could think you could have done differently. Mm -hmm. But in those moments and those times, it didn't happen that way. So to, to really regret things, I mean, I wouldn't even want to say that because, I mean, whatever happened, happened. And it, it kind of like made me and us and everybody who they are, man, and those things. I mean... It, even that incident with Fat Joe, if we just sat there like this and just waited for him to finish rocking, to us, that was like, he could just basically do whatever 
right. to us whenever he felt like it. And, and we would, men, like, no, this is, this is respect level right here, right, man. You're right. going to respect this. And we was carrying Boston on our back. And we felt right. like Boston gets the slight, the, the short end of the stick. And right. we're, we're going to end all of that. Right. And y'all was trying to prove that to the world. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. So we were, you were supposed to get to a point, I think we both um, lost the, uh, what, the, the, what we were talking about when we were talking about the stabbing. You were talking about... What made you, I asked you about regretting yeah. leaving, and then you were talking about that. Yeah, so Try that. ultimately, you know, ultimately I got stabbed in my back three times. Um, and so I went right, right to the hospital that time. You know, it was, it was really close to my spine. Hmm. The whole time when I'm in the in the um, emergency room, the cops is telling me I'm going to die. The, the D-boys is in there. They're like, yo, listen, you're going to die. These dudes stabbed you. Tell us who it is. Now, you know as well as I know that that's not going down. Um, you, you get stabbed. You take that. You go, you're going to either do nothing or you're going to do something. But what one thing you're not going to do, I'm not going to do. No one uh, uh, that I fuck with is going to tell who stabbed I'm not going to sit here and be like, yeah, they stabbed me. Whatever happened, I was involved in some shit. I was in the middle of a melee. It's possible that I could get stabbed. It happened. But the, the thing was, they was, the, the D-boys was telling me, you're going to die, just tell us who did it, blah, blah, blah. My daughter is 13 at the time, and she's trying to get through their legs to get to the table, the stretcher that I'm on, because they had me all strapped in on some don't move, you know, I couldn't move because I got stabbed in the back, so they mm -hmm. figured... Don't want to make it worse. Right. Mm -hmm. So all I, I could only turn like this and see my daughter. I couldn't turn my whole head. I could only go like this, and I could see her crying and crying, and I'm telling them, like, yo... I don't know who fucking stay. Even if I did, I'm not telling y'all. So move. But you're going to die. All right, well, let me die. But let me see my daughter before I die. And if that's what's going to happen. So they, they, wasn't, they wasn't taking no for an answer. They kept pressing and pressing on. My daughter finally was like, fuck it. And she's still feisty to this day. She's like that. She was like, fuck that. She went through their legs and got up to me and got right here on the bed and just was bawling out, bawling out, and crying, crying, crying. And I was having her little sister at the time. And she just was like, Daddy, all your friends is out in the lobby. And that, that pissed me off because I wouldn't have been out in the lobby. Now, I know some of my dudes was out there trying to put some work in. And, and I'll say this. The work that was going to get put in, a couple of dudes, when you're in a crew, you got like, You'll have like four dudes that are tight, three dudes that are tight that click together, and, and we we may be in a crew, but we got our right, own yeah, shit going. Right, on, you know I mean? section, right. Yeah, so the dudes that fuck with me in that click thing, they was on the, they was on that they ass, they was on the Rough Riders ass. The only thing that stopped that is that they had kids on the bus. Mm -hmm. That's what stopped that bus from looking like Swiss cheese. The fucked up thing, the fucked up thing, man. If it wasn't me. That was on the stretcher, and I, it's fucked up that I say this, but I wouldn't have gave a fuck about nobody on that bus. I would not have cared. In that time, in the way my mind worked, in the in the in the the fucking vengeance that I had, I wouldn't have cared. Plus, it happened in front of your child. Yeah, so I was pissed off, but niggas kept saying we couldn't do that either. The kids, the kids, the kids, the kids. After a while, I understood it. Um, but yeah, that, that, that ship, that, that, that tour bus was, it was going to be <laughs> a bad situation. So anyway, my daughter begged me to leave the group. That was all she was saying. And, you know, before she could even say, leave the group, I knew what she was getting at. And I said, you want me to leave the group? And she just was like, what about me? What about my little sister? Ah, crying, crying, crying. And I didn't like that look on her face. I didn't.